Hare Krishna, Chichandan Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you on the Monks podcast. Thank you so much for sparing your time today. It is my great pleasure. I have heard so many you know, wonderful things about this podcast and was able to look into one or two. I think it can become a very good discussion today. And I hope that I will be able to address you and your audience to your full satisfaction. Thank you, Maharaj. You know, since the first time I heard your classes, it was almost 16, 17 years ago, I was struck by two things which are in one sense difficult to combine. You have a very high level of introspection and devotional intensity. I'm using the word in a positive sense, but at the same time, you were remarkably approachable and friendly in your uh, in your the way you view your classes and the way you interact with devotees. So that I found very remarkable because generally when somebody is more introspective or devotional, it's uh, it's difficult for sometimes we may fear that uh, to approach that person. But you make you make devotees so comfortable by their classes by your by presenting your classes. Although you talk about the need for becoming serious in bhakti, but the way you, you could say, you help devotees to comfortably stretch out of their comfort zone. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for you to, for, to join. And I thought based on that, we could discuss a subject accordingly today. So I don't know how well I'm doing, but all I know is that as someone who wants to share knowledge advances or let us say becomes older in years, uh, the mm, value of compassion has to come into his life. Mm -hmm. He should think, what can I do to uplift others so that they will benefit? And I, I'm trying, I'm imperfect, but I'm trying to follow that uh, lead, so to say. Oh, thank you very much. So before we start the discussion, you have a very distinctive background. I don't think this is a like a Zoom uh, created image. It seems uh, this is this a part of your altar or uh, this is uh, this is I think Krishna and uh, uh, is it Radharani or Vrinda Devi? You could explain a little bit. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. Uh, well, I have heard that the Goswamis when they were not yet in Vindavan, but lived in Ramakeli, called different places in their environment by Vrindavan names. This is the Govardhan mountain, this is the Yamuna, this is Radha Kund and Syamakund. So similarly, we are trying in our Gora Bhavan, where we live, to find reminders of Vrindavan. In the back, there's a picture of Brinda Devi, who ushers the devotees into the spiritual dimension, and right next to her, the Lord of Vindavan, we call him Gopal Raj, uh, who is oh. engaged in lifting Giri Raj for the protection of his devotees. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if I could show you around, there are many such photos, pictures, uh, deities, because when we are outside of Vindavan, we still want to have Udipans or in, inspirations for the spiritual world. Oh, yes, Maharaj. It's uh, so, in one sense, Prabhupada's mission was also that he left Rindavan, but he carried Rindavan in his heart and he, through all his temples, he said, My temples are in Vaikuntha. So, he wanted to create the Vrindavan mood. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> hmm. So, Maharaj, I have uh, read this analysis of the tree of life which you often present. And the first time you spoke it, and I heard from you in this Radha Gopna temple, it struck me very much at how holistic and balanced it was. So I thought based on that model, we could discuss on the topic of uh, the self-care and chanting in spiritual, in, in our devotional growth or in our growth in life. So maybe if you want, you could, uh, this, the tree of life, this is a metaphor that you read somewhere or you or you were inspired by or you read and then you developed it 
uh, in the contemporary setting? Because it's a very striking metaphor. Yeah, um, uh, metaphor wants to express that just like a tree has roots, a trunk and a crown, a healthy human being must have spiritual roots, a spiritual practice. He must have as, as a trunk of his life, the way he stands in the world, uh, physical and emotional well-being. And he must also, like the tree, have a crown from where he contributes uh, his uh, social uh, well-being, uh, where he's useful. Uh, the metaphor uh, came uh, really from two sources. I think we all know the Upanishadic uh, analogy um, of, of uh, upside of down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is uh, that refers to the world. This world is a is a reflected tree, like you said, an upside down tree, the upside banyan tree. But in this tree-like world, the human being is a small tree. Uh, oh, okay. uh, uh, in, the, in the body, um, and there, uh, the Upanishads, uh, the Bhagavatam says, uh, there is a nest, um, or no, there, is a, there are two birds, in the yes. tree of life, the individual soul and okay. the super soul, one okay, okay. enjoys the fruits and uh, the other is just watching. Oh, okay. So, so the idea that our human body is like a tree came from this Bhagavatam and uh, how do you say, uh, and, and Upanishadic example, but it is a creative example. It is something I made up in order to take the wisdom of, uh, the trend, uh, of, of our scriptures and make it relevant for practical application. Oh, okay. Yes, I know, I, that tree example is very striking in terms of what you said. There are three aspects. There is the, we could say the inner and then the personal and the social, to put it that way, in one sense, the body and mind. So quite often, there is the conception that uh, spiritual life itself will solve all problems. That Prabhupada is attributed to have said, especially based on his conversation with his spiritual master, first conversation, that Krishna consciousness itself is the solution to all problems. So when we say that our spiritual foundation refers to uh, one aspect of the tree is it that uh, then is it that uh, our chanting or our devotional practices themselves will take care of the other aspects of the tree or is it that uh, we need to broaden our understanding of krishna consciousness that krishna consciousness is not just chanting but even taking care of uh, taking care of a physical and mental emotional well-being that is also within the ambit of krishna consciousness <laughs> Yes, thank you for this uh, necessary question. Um, and how much uh, does a spiritual person have to take care of the body and mind and, and his uh, relationship to others? Um, as, as long as we are in the material world, we have to be active in a parallel uh, way. One uh, area in which we act is our um, spiritual well-being, but then we have a body. We are now uh, with this vehicle, the material uh, body, and we have to also take care of the vehicle so that we reach our ultimate goal, uh, Krishna consciousness. Um, uh, that's why uh, Srila Prabhupada was thinking of introducing uh, next to the philosophy and the sadhana um, also Varnashram in our society. Uh, Varnashram is a structure in which uh, each individual member 
has uh, some physical well-being in terms of his safety, his income, his food, his chapatis, uh, mm. he, and he uh, he will find um, also uh, all the other human needs set, uh, fulfilled in the Vanashram uh, uh, system. Uh, Prabhupada, uh, uh, in order to bring the relevance. Uh, of Vanashram to our attention says it is meant to stabilize the shaking position in the world. Uh, we are not oh, yet okay. in the spiritual world. We need some support so that we are in this world uh, stabilized and and safe and uh, so on. So they need to be done parallel. However, this is very important right at the outset. You need. Just like when you go somewhere with a car, you need to take care of the car, but you always at all times need to have your goal in mind. Otherwise, your car might take you somewhere where you don't even wish to go. Um, so uh, self-care in itself is not uh, uh, sufficient. You need to mm combine it with the goal of life uh, uh, so that you take care of your vehicle, uh, of your body and mind uh, in order to reach the spiritual world. Oh, that's beautiful. The way you put it, the car body metaphor, the standard, we use it as a standard metaphor to talk about how our essential identity is spiritual. But that same metaphor can be used to emphasize the other point also, that for the soul to function in the world, it needs the vehicle. You know, I am not the car, but if I have to go somewhere, I need a car. So yeah. I need to take care of it from that perspective. Uh, a little while ago, many years ago, not a little while, it was about, I would say, seven years ago, I was invited um, um, uh, to Teheran. And I was uh, sitting in the park where Srila Prabhupada had walked when he visited uh, uh, Iran. And uh, uh, I had before me a manuscript of uh, a, a, a conversation, a, a typed conversation of his. And he, he made such a beautiful point. He said, uh, the, uh, Krishna consciousness does not mean to neglect the physical body. No, you take care of the physical body so that it can give the fruit of self-realization. Uh, mm. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, without, um, let us say, the assistance of the body, only self-realized souls can make it. Uh, those who are not yet self-realized, uh, who are in a body, will find that... Mm, diseases, strong emotional discontent, uh, 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 social isolation will discourage them so much that they will not pursue their spiritual life with enough strength and they will become uh, slow and, and discouraged. Uh, that I have seen in many cases uh, when... Mm, here in the West, when uh, our, uh, those who came to Krishna consciousness gave up uh, the path. They don't have difficulties with the philosophy. No, uh, they are convinced, but they have difficulties with the other people, the devotees, uh, or they feel, oh, I have no safety in my life. I, I must go to uh, take care of things uh, and leave the ashram. Um, uh, and so on. It's because these areas were not covered uh, to their full satisfaction. Thank you, Maharaj, for sharing this, especially the incident of Prabhupada talking about taking care of the body. You know, I was, uh, when you mentioned the tree metaphor, I just recollected that twice in the Bhagavatam also, the tree metaphor is used, but in a slightly different sense, where I think in the Bali Maharaj teaching, Bali Maharaj pastime, uh, Vaman Dev is being told by Shukracharya that don't give charity to Vishnu. 
but the reason he gives is that even if you want liberation you need the you need the like liberation is the fruit of the tree of the body but if the tree doesn't exist then you cannot get liberation and again the same metaphor comes in the teachings of vasudev to devaki that are not not in that teachings rather in that discussion where kamsa is about to kill devaki so vasudev also speaks the same metaphor so of course there it is talked the, the fruit that is talked about is liberation and what you talk about is the fruit as social contribution and we of course we can say that the ultimate social contribution is that we help others become liberated but the essential point of the tree is that that, that the body is essential that is uh, it seems it is there on many places in scripture and as you said it is there in prabhupada's words also uh, but uh, somehow is it that in the general presentations that we that were made to devotees in the maybe in the first few years of our movement uh, that the bodily dimension was neglected for some reason and uh, the idea that the more you can neglect your body the more you are spiritually advanced or the more the less you sleep the less you eat that in one sense you neglect the body so was that like a uh, uh, was that a a uh, connotation that came up because of some circumstantial reasons or how do we understand in like in scripture it is clear that body needs to be taken care of and the common sense also like the metaphors we can understand that but still it's widely prevalent that if somebody extends themselves a lot and neglects either their body or even their uh, social situation financial situation that is often seen as a sign of spiritual seriousness or spiritual advancement So, how did that notion come up, Maharaj? <laughs> I think it comes up in two. There are two perspectives. One is that it is, I think, very natural that at the beginning of one's spiritual path, one emphasizes his uh, spiritual development mm, over every other concern. Uh, those who have joined us they have done all um, before the material uh, life you know they have tried to earn they have tried to become educated they have tried to live a happy life in their families of where they were eating nicely and had nice relationships but they have found they are, cannot become satisfied uh mm-hmm. these things alone so therefore when they hear about krishna consciousness and the possibility to uh live an entirely soul based life uh th- that uh, uh, uh where you try to also get a relationship with god you think wow let me drop everything else aside and this is the best thing and you you emphasize it i think it is natural um uh, and uh, there are sociological um, studies which do say that in the beginning of every religious movement or spiritual movements movement the adherents or followers are only into this and then later as the movement grows uh uh they also need to take care of other things okay um, family concerns for instance the, the everyone is a celibate monk when they uh, join uh, and then concentrates really on the spiritual practice and after some time some may decide uh, no let me uh, also have a family and then other concerns come come in so i think it's permissible we have to excuse okay. our super enthusiastic devotees who may have been a little irrealistic they tried to give up the body and the mind and all their concerns but they found out later oops the body and mind is still there and it has some needs oh. also you you must know historically chaitanya's lord chaitanya's movement is uh, has uh, role examples the six goswamis of vrindavan who yes, gave up everything just one minute if you don't mind can i just respond to the previous point before you go to the second point because yes I, please so that, that was very striking so i have read 
in sociological studies about the zeal of the new convert yes. that whenever somebody joins but i had thought of it more in terms of they want to convert everyone to their path and that is true that this i have got the answers and everybody accept it and you know everybody else in ignorance but it can also so that you could say almost some form of extremism or fanaticism that can come not only in terms of imposing one's one's ideas on others but also imposing those ideas on oneself in a way that may not be sustainable or realistic on the long run so it could be almost like two sides of the same thing yes. one way is external on the world and another is on on one's own body and mind also so would you echo is that similar to what you are saying more or less 100 100% yes uh, uh. I would say the first it starts with wow I found it uh, and nothing else counts everything I I knew I was not becoming happy and then the second step wow this everyone should uh, should uh, take this and it's so good and and sometimes shaitanya charan prabhu another very unfortunate things comes hmm. it's only a theoretical finding it's only a conceptual agreement but it is not realized and because it's not realized uh, because the uh, individual has not yet found peace and is not yet deeply rooted he overcompensates his own weakness his own doubts by running into the world and trying to make everyone a uh, follower of uh, because that would give him finally the peace of mind yes others also agree with it and fanaticism is always an over compensation of uh, weakness uh, uh, we do not find realized souls fanatic we find them very integrating very compassionate towards others trying to see how they can help on what level they can help how much to give how much to not give uh, of the philosophy that's amazing like fanaticism is an expression of overcompensation it's a, it's such a striking thought once you put it in the sometimes some truths are inchoate they are there in the background nascent but once they are articulated it it makes so much sense this is so in once it's so self evident once it, it's made evident so thank you maharaj so so one reason you mentioned was that it is just natural in the process of spiritual growth and the other reason i think you were mentioning that our exemplars are renunciates was that the yeah point? the six goswamis of vindavan um, uh, they uh, as you know were very renown renounced out uh, uh, they 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 stayed every night under a different tree that means they had no dwelling uh, 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 where they would permanently uh, uh, be only later they had bhajan stalis where they would do their bhajans tear kadamba and and pavan sarova and other places but they were very renounced we have stories of sanatan swami offering his deity every day a little a little it was not even a full chapati a little bowl of roasted grains and then lord madan mohan says can't you just offer me offer me a little salt at least so he was so renounced sanatan goswami and they wrote the books they uh, uh, gave uh, the philosophy they made the first temples of gaudiya vaishnavism they they established the foundation and uh, and uh, but it is necessary to understand their uh, sense uh, their renunciation was a state of consciousness which you call vairagya the world had lost their colors of attraction and only the spiritual world was attracted to for them it was a sign of their great love for krishna they didn't practice renunciation they didn't have to struggle or should i take a cold shower or warm shower or should i eat less that was not even in their mind 
uh, we who are not like this uh, and who practice uh, renunciation without having that state of mind, uh, we need another medicine which the Goswamis gave us. And I want to uh, uh, quote it, uh, uh, what Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami said about uh, proper renunciation. And you will, um, I don't know, how do you respond to what uh, I said, the role model of the uh, Vindavan Goswamis gave us um, an example and an ideal of renunciation. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. I mean, it's it's now that you are speaking this, so a lot of thoughts are going on in my mind. While well, the Goswamis exemplified extraordinary renunciation, but in their books, they did not really standardize that. Like in one of the principles in Rupa Goswami is saying that you know you should a devotee should not be neglectful in ordinary activities. And Prabhupada gives example like even brushing your teeth, we should be attentive. <laughs> so, in one sense, we could say the exemplars are they are exceptions like a, uh, is it that we would like to go at that level but unless we have that love of god artificially trying to go at that level can be counterproductive mm. yes is we can we we can enter a world of uh, uh, concealment actually where outwardly we are very renounced but inwardly we hang after position prestige, um, and uh, sometimes even uh, after worldly goods. Uh, what I wanted to say, uh, um, uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, is the medicine which the Goswamis gave was called Yukta Vairakya, or proper oh, okay. renunciation. And the way yes. they, the way they uh, uh, articulated it was, uh, Rupa Goswami said in the Bhakti, Rasamrita Sindhu, Anashaktasya Vishayan, Yataham Upa Yun Yataha, etc. Mm. One who is not attached to satisfying, satisfying his senses, yet accepts everything in relation to Krishna, is properly situated in renunciation. And then in the next verse, he makes it even more clearer. He says, That renunciation which is practiced by those desirous of impersonal liberation and which rejects things in connection with Lord Hari, thinking them to be material, is called falgu vairagya, external or false renunciation. It won't stand very long. So when there is something, this is Prabhupada's uh, understanding of renunciation, that is useful for devotional service, and which comes from the material world. You, you accept it, but not uh, for sense gratification, but in the service for Krishna. And our body, look at this, how useful the body is. It has hands to clap during kirtan. It has a tongue to chant. It has ears to hear. It is a kirtan body. Or... Uh, if you want to not just say one sadhana should be done by the body, you would say that it's a sadha, sadhana sharira, a vehicle to perform uh, spiritual practices. It's very useful. If you use it for your self-realization, it is a, a, it's a gift that assists you. Oh. That's proper renunciation. Yes, Mahasha, it's beautifully put. So it's it's not only you could say uh, it's not just a sign of fanaticism or uh, overcompensation as you said early, but it's also uh, there's also philosophically it's a misunderstanding of how things are to be done, and uh, so so when the Goswamis exemplify renunciation, it is it is that they are not actually in one sense neglecting their bodies. That they are, is it that you understand that they are functioning at such a high level of spirituality that their bodily needs themselves have become minimized? So, uh, yes. because if we, because as you said, the Goswamis would eat very less, sleep very less. And, uh, but their Vairagya, of course, was not Falgu. So they were, you, so their renunciation was in no way coming in the way of using their body in Krishna's service. 
so if it becomes falgu when we uh, when we neglect the body and then we are not able to use the body in krishna's service so is that yeah. their under proper understanding maharaj yes yes i myself made that mistake in the very early beginning of krishna consciousness i was very much attracted by renunciation because i come from a wealthy family and had um, yeah material a very opulent material life um, before i came so i thought let me do exactly the opposite and i remember there were times when i ate for a year only one apple a day and a few raisins and uh, after some time i became so emaciated and weak my mind was also not able to concentrate there was so much vata uh, that uh, one very kind devotee sat down with me and said this is not good for bhakti uh, this is uh, you cannot do devotional service uh, um, you have exaggerated uh, renunciation in an unhealthy way and he explained then the concept of yukta vairagya and this is what he said at that time he oh. said he said there are three visions on the world karma that means how can i enjoy the world it is looking at the world with the intention is there something for me to enjoy and if yes then how can i get it then there's gyana the opposite it looks away from the world oh no the world is entangling the gyani says uh, but then there is bhakti and he said in bhakti we look beyond the world we don't look at the world we don't look away from the world we look beyond the world we look to krishna and see what is useful in his devotional service and how can i develop love Oh okay yeah the the concept of renunciation which was maybe there in my mind when i was immature very immature i'm not saying i'm mature now but in the very beginning was i wanted i was such a uh, accomplished sense enjoyer now i wanted to become an accomplished renouncer uh in mm-hmm. the early time i was admired for money uh for wealth for opportunity for sense gratification now i turned around i wanted to be uh uh known as someone who eats very little who sleeps very little but the same uh hungry eye who wanted to be uh in the center of was still there um bhakti means krishna is in the center <laughs> it's not about uh, you enjoying or renouncing it is about krishna it's a total different perspective oh beautiful so look at the world look away from the world but look beyond the world that's nicely about karma gyan and bhakti so we can say in one sense the body also represents a part of the world so it's a very striking vision i try to also play with words when i write on the gita so i had thought of a play of like romantic we sometimes we romanticize the world we, we demonize the world and then we <laughs> utilize the world so yes wonderful <laughs> so, thank you wonderful <laughs> thank you maharaj so maharaj uh, with respect to the body i think most devotees have now recognized the need to take care of the body in my, in one sense as our movement is also uh, growing many of our devotees senior devotees are becoming older where the need for bodily care becomes more evident also uh, if we could uh, shift the discussion from the body to the mind a little bit unless you want to elaborate something on the body further mm. but it seems till now emotional care is something or taking care of the emotional side or the emotional needs mental health emotional health that sometimes is still seen as uh, as something which is is this really necessary if somebody is having mental health challenges we often say mantra is manastrayate iti mantra 
<laughs> that the mantra frees us from all mental problems. So it does, now we understand that you, earlier you started by talking about a parallel lanes that we take care of our bhakti and we also take care of our body. That is because the essential vehicle for serving Krishna. But to what extent do we also take care of the mind, not just through bhakti practices, but through some other measures also, which may be required for the care of the mind. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. You have a very deeply engaging uh, way of looking at uh, 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 subjects or of issues which are of need for the spiritual practitioner. Um, Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, well, in this world, we find a model called the py py uh, pyram uh, pyramid of needs. It was um, presented for the first time by Maslow. Yeah, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Yeah, of needs. yeah. And he used to say, uh, first, we have physiological needs. You need to have food. If you don't eat for one year, I mean, most probably, uh, most of us will give in after um, one week already. Uh, then there is problem when there is no sleep and mm -hmm. you become totally sleep deprived. Uh, you will not have uh, your sadhana. Uh, uh, you can't concentrate on chanting. Then when that is fulfilled, you go a step higher into your safety needs, then to the uh, belongingness and love needs. And I wanted to say here, this is of course a material, uh, uh, it is not coming from bhakti, this uh, pyramid, but it is useful to a certain extent. And I once asked uh, Radhanath Maharaj, when, at what stage does someone decide to um, join the Krishna consciousness movement? And Maharaj said so nicely, it's not because of being uh, convinced of the philosophy that someone primarily joins because of this reason. He said, it's because he feels these people are better uh, than the other people uh, which I, I have uh, uh, association with. I want to rather be with them uh, uh, than with the other people who seem to live on a sinking ship and so on. So they want to belong. They want to have friendships amongst devotees. I mean, uh, don't we hear this from Rupa Goswami, fr uh, friendship with like-minded uh, mm. devotees is ne necessary. Um, and then, then it goes to esteem needs. I would say it's more being in my dharma. For instance, I am a preacher. Prabhupada told me this. I would not do very well uh, as, um, let us say, cleaning uh, the, uh, uh, a place. I would do a lousy job because I would be, uh, my dharma seems to be different, my svadharma. So, so also, you get a lot of dissatisfaction when you don't find your dharma, and if you don't, but if you find it, you will be respected by others. Oh, he is a good cleaner. He is a good uh, preacher. He is the, this and that. It's a definite uh, need. Uh, so, uh, um. I have translated, I have looked at this pyramid of need. I found it was useful um, in Korea, uh, talking about physical well-being, emotional well-being. And if you go higher, it goes into social well-being. Uh, because uh, these things are simply, this is the way the world is. It is... Uh, um, but what the materialist doesn't always have so clear is for what do you do this? For what purpose is this existing? Uh, what should you uh, mm. attain by taking care of? Why, uh, why do this? And 
I would like to just because it is so important to understand this. I would like to share something which Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, wrote about loving oneself. For a devotee, this uh, self-care or loving oneself, some people say, sounds mm -hmm. so opposite to, to all he wants to do. He wants to love Krishna. He wants to attend to Krishna. He wants to care for Krishna's concern. And then all of a sudden, what is this new age, wishy-washy, love yourself and take care of yourself? This objection is justified when you don't take care of yourself with the right motivation, with the right goal, then you will be totally entangled in Maya. But if you do this with a proper mood, uh, then yes, your progress will be there. Uh, here, there's a question. What is the prayer of one who loves Krishna? And then Bhakti Thakur answers this. With my body, mind, and speech, may my love for the reddish lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu increase day by day. And then he says, for, let me have unflinching love for the Vaishnavas. Let me have love for Krishna's qualities. Let me have love for the holy name. Mm -hmm. uh, let me love those people who are have taken shelter at Krishna's lotus feet. And then he ends. Mm. Let me also love myself. Oh. Who am inclined towards Krishna so that I may attain devotion to him. Let me repeat this. Let me also love myself who am inclined toward Krishna so that I may attain devotion to him. So after, after taking care of his bhakti, he wants to love Lord Chaitanya, the devotees, the chanting of the holy name. He says, I am on the trying to be on the path of bhakti. I'm inclined to Krishna. So in that way, with that perspective, I will take care of myself so that I can reach his lotus feet. See, everything in this world, dualistic world, you can do it right, you can do it wrong. If you take care of yourself without uh, um, the perspective of going to Krishna, you become a selfish egomaniac. <laughs> and we know these people. We know, know these people. We have seen them everywhere who are only, now, I like it like this. My way or the highway, uh, because this is how I feel well if I do it like this. This is the sure road to material entanglement. But if you say, okay, let me take care of myself so that I'm fit and free for Krishna, I don't have to, that I can dance for him uh, to, for many hours, <laughs> that I can think of a new book to write, like Chaitanya Charan. You must have written by now 30 books or so. Um, uh, uh, so th th for this, you need to be free to do this, the, of concerns and so on. Then it is very good. There could be many examples of how uh, one thing done in the therapeutic way is good, but the same thing done for just sense gratification is very bad for you. So you have to uh, do self-care in a spiritual frame. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful, Maharaj. That quote is remarkable on Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And uh, another point which you mentioned toward the end was that uh, you talked about therapeutic use. So normally we talk about that more in terms of material things that material objects, that is often used in connection with Yukta Vairagya. But what you are saying is that can also apply to our inner life. That taking care of our mind and as self-care or self-love, as you mentioned, that it can, if it is within a devotional context, then it becomes, a, it, it can become a part of our inner healing. 
so that's that's beautiful maharaj just one point about this so is it that uh, say we become lovable or we should love ourselves after we become pure enough to be lovable or is it at whatever condition level we are at that time also we we should still uh, love ourselves not in the narcissistic sense but in the sense of uh, in a in the functional sense or in the healthy sense so is that love for oneself an advanced stage of devotion because in that quote of bhakti ro thakur he that comes almost at the end so can a condition or can or should a condition soul also love oneself a sadhaka as you know the word atma or mm. self carries different connotations uh, according to the various perspectives you know i wouldn't say love the body you know or love the mind i would say here the word care is more yeah, okay appropriate yes uh, that uh, that it is uh, taking care of like if you take care of of your vehicle because you know it can carry you uh, to where you need to go mm, yes uh, yes and uh, i believe this is very much part of varna shram um chetanya charan prabhu we here in the north european zone uh, at one stage uh we're thinking a little bit uh, of uh, varna shram we noticed that um uh, we have a responsibility to take care of old people uh, we noted we have a responsibility to take care of children of um, people in the congregation and we wanted we looked for a system that would give us insights first of all where to place everyone and then to see their uh, needs and their rights also which they have in a society and we uh, we worked on that quite elaborately shila prabhat had told our um, leader that he should uh, explore uh, this varnashram model and see how it could be applied for iskon and it was at that time could be this was 25 years back it was really back uh, at that time we were um, uh, thinking of varnashram then we totally forgot it because it was too difficult to bring it into uh, an iskon context we had to take care of our temples of our farm uh, projects of um, printing and distributing uh, literature and um, we uh, we we left this then uh, a few years ago uh, when uh, i started to uh, uh, look for a model that is holistic a spirit a presentation for the outside world where they would see the body mind and and people are well taken care i read a book by bhakti vinod tako which really was a, a mind turner for me uh, he it's the book chaitanya shikshamrita i believe mm-hmm. yes yes and uh, it is a elaborate description how to apply varnashram to spiritual minded people and in that book he said the whole purpose of this is to take care of people's spiritual physical emotional and social well-being and with this uh i had it it may not be possible maybe it is but we were not successful to institute varnashram on a broader level in the society it was not possible for us i know there are very very serious efforts on the hungarian farm which were spearheaded or are spearheaded by his holiness shiva ramaraj 
um, but we could not do it. Uh, but um, when uh, uh, I saw these things, physical, emotional, and uh, spiritual, uh, so, uh, social and spiritual well-being, then I thought, okay, let me first of all practice like this. And I, I started to do exercises and yoga for physical well-being. The sadhana part was already uh, in, in part. I, 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 I didn't um, uh, look at it so much. Emotional well-being. I thought, well, what to do? Well, I found out when I'm focused on a service for Krishna, which I do according to my natural inclination, my dharma, I feel just happy. I'm, I'm, I, I feel uh, in my place. I feel uh, satisfied. And then I thought, okay, Sachinanda Swami, you have been a preacher. You have done something on the social platform. But have you done it in your early enthusiasm? Maybe you look at it and no. And then I found out, yes, I need to now no longer preach in a, to, to increase our membership or to, to be known as a, as a preacher, an irresistible preacher. <laughs> uh, I need to do it with compassion. And I discovered this uh, a value of compassion. Uh, as, uh, and I was happy to read in Jaiva Dharma that compassion should be the main dharma of a Vaishnava in this world. So yes, we are there to help others, to benefit society, um, so we, to be compassionate uh, friends. Oh, that, That's my journey, so to say. <laughs> Thank you, Arash, for sharing this beautifully. So if I understand right, uh, and try to retrace the flow, what you're saying is that uh, that if we are actually going to be compassionate to people, then we, we need to be holistically compassionate. That it is a part of our spiritual growth to actually take care of the complete person. Uh, we can't just say, I'm going to take care of your soul and I don't bother about anything else. So in one sense, Varanashram or any other initiative to take care of uh, people financially, take a, align them with their psychophysical nature. So it seems that... Uh, actually taking care of the body and the mind in terms of helping uh, oneself and others become aligned with one's own psychophysical nature and uh, providing a supportive community that people can belong to. And so this is, this is a part of our anashram and we could say this is, uh, this is not mundane, it's an expression of compassion so that people can smoothly move in their spiritual journey. Was that the connection? Am I articulating? Yes, that? yes, yes, okay. yes. That is, uh, that is. Uh, um, you frame it very nicely in the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. I like to also frame it in in another way. Okay. Mm, uh, uh, the way I I had a few very personal encounters with Srila Prabhupada, but only a few, two or three, but uh, he was very personal and caring for me, to me. And I would like to only say here one which impressed me. Now, I was in, it was in Sweden, and I had not slept the, well the night, so when I came to Prabhupada's uh, lecture, I already no, I will be tired, so better I stand at the uh, end of the, you know, behind all the devotees. But even in standing, <laughs> my body started to sway from tiredness. And, I, and then Prabhupada, he just interrupted his lectures and said, let him go to bed. He does so much service, he should sleep now. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think it's, it's just human nature that you see someone has a real need, not just a, a, a sensual desire, but a real need. And then a, a human kind person will say, yes, yes, no. I, I was thinking he would chastise me. You are not interested in philosophy. You're only good in eating and sleeping. 
ah, they are not really my disciple. I thought when he stopped his lecture, he would say like this. But then he said, no, you need to do so much service. You, you just go and take your rest now and sleep well until you are strong and healthy. It's a compassion. It's a human nature. It's not just, um, uh, 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 let me say, a philosophically understood uh, need or strategy. It is uh, something um, uh, uh, which a mature person will do. Like, like for, for some, Prabhupada wrote this very famous letter. First comes your health. Then comes your sadhana. Then comes your seva. The, he wrote this letter. I would like to know the context in which he wrote it. Was, did he write this to a devotee who was ill? Then th this, looks, this statement looks, we, we understand it in one way. Did he mean it as a general prescription for all the devotees? I must admit to you, I do not know the context so that I cannot answer this. But at least there is a letter of Prabhupada where he says, uh, first health, then sadhana, then seva. Mm. Uh, although we usually think seva first, then sadhana, sadhana well, I don't know. Uh, maybe you, you know what I want to say. We may yes, put yeah. the order in a different way. Yeah, we may even invert the order completely. Sometimes for seva, we may give the highest priority. And we extend ourselves so much that both health and sadhana get neglected. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So, so now uh, going back to the earlier point of Varanashram. So, if I understand right, when you're talking about Varanashram, it's not so necessarily so much in terms of like we create an elaborate social structure that could also be a possibility. But if I understand it, what you're saying is as an individual, uh, applying Varanashram would mean trying to align ourselves, align our services, our engagements with what we understand is about our nature. So yeah. that will itself give us some amount of satisfaction and that will lead to uh, more, a little bit more of emotional health and robustness. Was yeah. that, was you, were you using Varanashram in that sense? Yeah, I, I always think we need to understand the philosophy like this. If we cannot uh, apply all the steps for cultural reasons, for manpower reasons, for so many reasons, then we need to see the essence uh, and uh, go with the essence. And Varnashrama is a model for uh, taking care of these uh, uh, needs, the spiritual needs, the physical and emotional needs, the social uh, and the social needs. So I would also further recommend if you want to find your uh, the, the proper way in which you take care of the needs, it's sometimes very, very useful to talk with others. Best is with spiritually mature people. In the old times, these were brahmanas. Uh, and uh, see, how do you see me, Prabhu? Uh, what have you noticed is, is, um, my, uh, is my lacking and where can I uh, improve? It helps because often we are uh, a little bit blind uh, when it comes to these things. We are sick because we didn't know how to keep a healthy uh, way. We are uh, sad because we have not known how to have emotional well-being. We are um, maybe uh, spiritually undernourished because we have not uh, known ourselves how to nourish ourselves properly. So therefore, um, people can sometimes act as a healthy mirror in which you can see all those parts in you which you cannot see without the help of a mirror. Okay. So you are talking here more in terms of uh, some guiding association Yes. that can help us understand ourselves. So yes. then whether when we are taking care of our emotions, is it, or taking care of us emotionally, are we, are we doing that in a healthy way? Are we doing that in the right way? 
or are we doing it in terms of say pandering to ourselves so what would be a healthy and unhealthy way we will be able to better understand that by having uh, other devotees who guide us is that uh, yes you 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 have a very keen intel- intellect who, which can put order into uh, different subjects yes thank you himanaj so uh, now so going back to a slightly earlier question uh, which uh, so if somebody is uh, you earlier you mentioned three things that physical disease uh, i think you talked about mental distress or may, and social isolation all these three will result if somebody doesn't take care of themselves holistically so to some extent can all of these be taken care of by more chanting like somebody's relationship either in their devotional circles or in their other family circles if they're not devotees if those relations are not good can greater chanting heal those relationships and satisfy their emotional needs or we or in one sense to be able to chant attentively we need a certain level of emotional stability or emotional health so are these two uh, two distinct things or are they related can one replace the other like so many things in devotional life uh, everything depends on your adhikar your capability your present uh, state uh chaitanya charan prabhu i am personally very convinced that if someone can take full shelter at the holy name the holy name will purify the heart from all the things which should not be there and uh, one will feel a deep sense of a relatedness to krishna so uh, uh, at that time uh, one will heal on many levels i do know that shila bhakti sananda saraswati taku um, he prescribed the holy name also in terms of physical illness he told his brahmacharis they didn't need to go to a medical doctor i i'm supposing this was not in severe cases like like uh, mm. for cancer or so but um, you know mostly he said he, they should chant now if someone can take shelter in the chanting of the holy name with body mind and soul many many things in his life will become auspicious uh, the bhakti lata beach will grow and it is described in the madhurya kadambini that if you water the seed of bhakti and it grows then mm, uh, uh, the bhakti uh, lata will sprout two leaves one is klesha agni you will become free from misery mm. and shubhada the other is you will feel very uh, you feel will feel auspiciousness coming into your life uh, i have been given uh, the service to give retreats on japa um, uh, and also kirtan we have many kirtan melas and so on and uh, i have seen miracles happening for those who have taken full shelter uh, in the holy name i have seen people become even cured from diseases uh, who made uh, a turn and taken care still i don't think it necessarily is an either or um, discussion mm. uh, i think uh, someone who is chanting um, uh, and takes full care in chanting will understand what do i need here to make my chanting uh, uh, well for instance i have seen 
that uh, there are I do personal japa retreats where I mm, chant from the morning till the evening, and I've seen I can be much more awake if I do just for 20 minutes a few exercises that get the circulation going so that my the body mm. will, and mind will not feel tired. I don't think this is necessarily an, an, an contradiction. I realize if I would be full of pure love of Godhead, I don't think Gokeshore does Babaji or Jagannath does Babaji would do yoga in the chanting uh, mm. sessions. I, I don't think so. At least I, it's, it's not hurt. Uh, mm. I do know that Prabhupada did morning walks mm, uh, because it was good for his circulation. Um, I think it's a little bit a question of common sense and how much you take care of the body mm, and so on. Observe yourself. Um, what does the body need in order to be uh, active in devotional service? Uh, uh, can you do Nirjal Ekadasi and uh, do your service? Um, you know, an Ekadasi where you neither drink nor eat anything. Or is it maybe better if you drink a glass of water? You, you have to see that yourself. Um, and you will have the intelligence to decide these questions. At the time when you make Krishna and your advancement in Krishna consciousness, your main goal. If this main goal goes, then you many things will come out of balance and out of synchronicity in your life. But nice, and since you you asked, you let us speak more on chanting, uh, Chaitanya uh, Chandra Charan. I, I'm much more, ex much more, uh, I'm talking much more about chanting and of um, Krishna Kata <laughs> these days than the tree of life. Uh, nice. First things first. <laughs> should yes. go first. That's beautiful. So I think the Adhikar point which you made, it addresses a lot of things that if even Prabhupada talked about Rastila, he's, he quoted the words that hearing Rastila will become purified. But if you are becoming agitated, then don't hear the Rastila. Mm -hmm. So we could say similarly about caring, caring self-care. Like, like, if not doing that is creating a problem, uh, and if doing that is helping, then, then we can do it. So it, for some, like Gaurishwara Babaji might not need it, but uh, <laughs> we may need it. So I think the Adhikar, somehow I feel that the concept of Adhikar is often talked more in terms of uh, uh, like abstract levels than in terms of practical application. Yes, we understand pure devotees are constantly absorbed in love for Krishna. But in terms of that, each of us needs to understand our adhikar and practice accordingly. That sometimes is not adequately emphasized. So uh, if, if a devotee wants to determine their adhikar, is that also something which consult devotees or consult senior devotees and understand or is by self-observation we can understand our adhikar also yeah uh, uh, self-observation is uh, very very necessary self in in um, introspection but i would say aided self-observation okay. therefore the Philosophy is very important. Uh, you, uh, when you read and understand the books uh, well, um, you, there will be a time when you will integrate the teachings and then you can really decide and see most of the things yourself because you are helped by a perfect source. Uh, this is called Shastra Shakshu. You see the world through the scriptures, through that lens, and uh, through the lens of the scriptures, whoop, you see many, many uh, things much more clearer than without that lens. Uh, uh, and then, mm, if you have 
if you want to go to others to advise you, make sure they know you, make sure that the others whom you asked have affection for you, they, they are concerned for your growth and well-being, because only then when they know you, and they have the motivation mm, to, mm, to, to compassionately help you, is their advice really suitable. But self-observation can help us a lot uh, to see the Adhika. You gave this beautiful example of uh, listening to Rasa Lila and other such uh, related kata. Um, um, you can definitely see when it purifies you, then your bliss of Krishna consciousness. But if this should agitate you and you begin to think of the man and woman relationship, then uh, for now you can observe this is not uh, good for uh, my spiritual life at this stage. Let me put this book on the pile of books which I read later when I have mm. uh, increased my spiritual life. So self-observation can immediately uh, help you. And I believe that this uh, manana, is a very important part of the life of a devotee. First comes Shravanam, he must hear. Then comes Mananaha, that means he must reflect on what he has uh, heard and in this way also do and, and include self-reflection uh, or self-observation in it. And then he should see what can I apply in the Nididhyasan and on the third step. And then uh, your life will be increasingly uh, spiritual. You hear something, you reflect about it in relationship to you, the world, and so many other things. And then you see what of the many things you have heard and reflected can you now today apply in your uh, Krishna conscious practice. And then it will go very, very Beautiful. Yes, the scriptures are meant to make us independently thoughtful. There is such a, a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> do, do you know, Chaitanya Charan, a, a guru should have one goal in teaching. He should teach in such a way that the disciple knows what to do even in his absence. And the example is given yeah. of the son who gives his light or her light uh, to the moon so that even when the sun uh, sets in the western uh, horizon, there is a source of light. The moon can shine on its own. It has given, uh, it has received the rays. So in our spiritual training, our spiritual life, we should really take care uh, that we uh, become uh, have the self uh, observation and self this that that's the goal of the whole learning process one of the goals one of the the other is to fall madly in love <laughs> yes of course and it's a very beautiful point uh, the way you phrased it in, in in say we could say material books on counseling i had read the success of a counselor is to make oneself redundant that but I had not thought about it in spiritual terms, but what you are saying is that in terms of the mood of devotional dependence, we often emphasize, you know, that Janme Janme Prabhu say that my I am eternally dependent on my spiritual master's mercy. So in terms of that mood, it will always be there. But in terms of practical decision making, a, it, a disciple should be able to make decisions. Yes. In like the absence of the absence of the spiritual master also. Like Prabhupada would say about us, when will they ever learn? <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, okay. And this is quite a radical thought. Even the example of the sun and the moon is also very striking. So, so some, so this idea, sometimes we become maybe a little fear, or sometimes a little fear is uh, is is there in the hearts, or it's maybe sometimes it will trigger in the heart also that in the name of being independently thoughtful, we may become independent. Yeah. But what you are making the point is that 
that it may well happen that we may not have the guidance at some time that the spiritual master may not be accessible for whatever reasons so that being able to take one's own decisions it's not necessarily something which is whimsical or or defy it may not be a sign sign of defiance it can also be the sign of the success of a disciple or success of a guru in training the disciple also 100% but the disciple should always remain devotionally dependent if you don't show your mercy to me i'm nothing like this but he should learn and uh, he should be able to give a lecture where the spurt master says wow he has learned nicely the spurt master is in the disciples lecture and he says this disciple have learned has learned properly um, i have seen this in mature disciples they uh, are devotionally always dependent they are always love their spurt master but they are able to make decisions to lead to guide others and so on without having to always ask uh, 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 only in times when it's not yet clear there will be uh, asked but yes the the guru wants his disciple to be independently thoughtful and devotionally of course <laughs> connected janme janme prabhu se <laughs> yes so so this point of just to elaborate a little bit on the point of independent thoughtfulness that um, with respect to so if somebody feels by their own independent thoughtfulness that i am at a phase of my life where i need to maybe at this time take greater care of my body or take greater care of my mind and my emotions and my relationships and so would this also change over the years is it to say necessary that over the years a person say maybe in the, like earlier you said earlier women in the early years of our life we may neglect our body then afterwards we may recognize that okay i have to take greater care uh, then as we grow further when we are become authentically detached we may also maybe neglect or neglect or transcend we could say more appropriately transcend some aspects of the body's demands so is this uh, like a linear progression or could there be ups and downs that means in a devotee's life there could be phases when they irrespective of whether they are more advanced or less advanced could there be phases when they need to take greater care of their emotional side the physical side we understand if somebody falls sick and they has a severe sickness then now then definitely they need to take care but can a devotee uh can even a very senior or advanced devotee experience some emotional turbulences which may need the necessitate that they take greater care of their emotional side yes i want to give you what we always thought is that spurt a life oops okay yeah, yes i can see a straight linear graph yeah is okay. like like this it is one upward uh yeah, graph okay. right uh, but as a cl- on a closer inspection you see that sometimes a person has to take care more of the body he may be uh, he may be ill and has to take maybe a half a year um, more concentrated Uh, attention to the body and then jup he goes back into the old trage- trajectory that is uh, uh uh but what i have seen chitanya charan is that spurt life is a little bit i'm not such a good draw it's like a spiral oh uh, spiral uh, okay yes and uh, a spiral in a spiral it goes uh it goes up but you always come to the same point which you were before let me under, let me give you an example as a bhakta a young devotee you might have been disturbed when uh, someone 
ate mm, your gulab jamun and uh, you were uh, 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 and and you become very angry so uh, your false ego reacted who do you think you are i'm two weeks early and more in your in the society of krishna conscious i'm your senior by two weeks and so on then it, two weeks. Then, <laughs> yes then he may he may it may go he may go further advance further then he may be a sanyasi in the as a danda stands there in the kirtan and one young perspiring devotee whirls around whirls around whirls around and loses his balance and falls on the sanyasi and the sanyasi loses his danda now there are two responses he could give a mature response and say please uh, maybe you have spun too much and lost your balance and and not make a big thing out of it or he could as a sanyasi become totally disturbed uh, like he became as a bhakta uh, when someone stole his gulab jamun uh, uh, and he may be very very uh, 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 angry all of a sudden, not in control of his uh, emo emotions. At that time, after the incident, he would sit down and say, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. I was too much hurt uh, on my sensitive ego. I should definitely improve uh, here. So in other words, the same issues come up again and again. Uh, uh, issues of material attachments come up uh, even as you go higher. Even we understand at the level of bhava, there are still issues that come up like aparadas, making offenses and so on. So you need, I think, the spiral model uh, where you move upwards but you come to the same areas, east, west, south areas, and serves us more in our spiritual advancement and sheds a genuine light on, uh, on genuine self-purification and transformation of the heart. So uh, I wanted to say this in response to your question, do issues come up again? Why, yes, and then they are left and are not important uh, because you move forward and onwards in your life. But then again, you might mm, uh, uh, confront them, the same issue, but in a more mature way, hopefully, hopefully. <coughs> okay, so this is... So And now I'm understanding why you use the spiral metaphor. So it's that, say, a devotee who faces a health challenge at the, when they are, say, five years in Krishna consciousness and a devotee who says, faces a health challenge, or we could say even an emotional, relational challenge also, when they are 25 years or when they are 45 years, the challenge itself may be the same in, in broad, broad principle. And in all three cases, they may need to focus a little bit more on dealing with those challenges. But based on their spiritual advancement, they will have greater maturity, greater insight. So it's like they will be facing that challenge itself, from, but from a higher perspective. Yes, and deal totally different with it. Sometimes the health challenge for an advanced devotee, he will say, oh, I don't care any longer for the body. Let it degenerate. I don't want any medical invasion. I, it's time for me to leave this world. He will not be so disturbed about the health challenge as he was when, when he was a bhakta. Okay. So overall, when, when, uh, so when, you, when you're giving the example of a spiral, that means, uh, again, it comes back to the point of adhikar and self-observation that I have to know where I'm on the spiral. So that also means that just because a senior devotee dealt with this problem in this way doesn't necessarily mean that I also have to deal with the problem in the same way. 
yeah. I could, I may have to deal with it in a different way. Yes. So yes. I just give one example. Uh, if in case you would like to address that, like one devotee recently mentioned to me that, you know, whenever I fall sick, I never take painkillers. So I asked, why is that? Actually, I talk about this with many different devotees. And one devotee said, you no, know, painkillers have so many side effects and other things. I, I want to avoid those. But then another devotee mentioned to me that uh, in, if by my past karma, I am supposed to go through some pain by taking painkillers, what I'm just trying to escape that karma. So let me get that pain right now. But then I talk with another devotee, this is the, the, the diversity, they said that, okay, but if that pain is so much that I can't chant, I can't study, I can't do any service, then even if it's my karma, it's like, I can't bear so much karma right now. So better let me take some painkiller and maybe that karma will come in the future. So another devotee gave me a response that actually in one sense, if we take the karma argument too far, we can say that, where do you stop? If the weather is so too hot, should we use a fan? The discomfort because of the heat also is because of my karma only. I'm in such a, I'm in living in a place where it's so hot or so cold because it's my karma. So should we not try to deal with any discomfort at all? So in one sense, we could say all of these could be valid personal approaches based on so is, when a person is at different levels of the spiral. Could, <laughs> could we say that like that? Maharaj? Wonderfully said, yes. Uh, and the different levels on the spiral obviously relate to one's own adhika or capability and uh, one should not imitate the ways of another. Yes, very, very nicely uh, summarized. Thank you, Maharaj. Maybe just, uh, wait, can we have two, three more questions, Maharaj, before we finish? If you wait, of course. Thank you. So, is it that uh, you know, in our scriptures, we don't see much examples of self-care? We talk, we see more of the uh, self-denial or renunciation more. So could it be that as Kali Yuga is, uh, we could say, progressing or regressing, depending on the perspective, as Kali Yuga is moving forward, is it that uh, we will need, uh, we means as individuals, as well as in our outreach people are coming to us, a greater degree of, um, of self-care will be required because people are more disturbed, there's far greater stress and other things. And even the family structures and the relationships are more uh, unstable today. So could it be that self-care is a great, if you consider even 50 years before and today, society has become much more disintegrated now as compared to a few decades ago. So will self-care play a greater role in a sadhaka's life in today's world as compared to say a more traditional setting? I do think so. I just recently read in the Bhagavatam about the rule of uh, King Preto, and he was described to be a father to each single one of his citizens, which included even the animals, uh, the prajas. So that was the ideal, at least in the old times, that people should be cared for. And whenever that is not happening, uh, then uh, the ex existential needs which are there, um, which need to be also fulfilled, need to be fulfilled in a different way. We can't expect the government or the, uh, the yeah, to, to take care. They may, their hands may be bound in so many ways. Yes, so definitely in a uh, progressive Kali Yuga, where the mm, effects of uh, ill management and whew, so many unfortunate circumstances become increased, you need to see how you can remain functional in your spiritual life and take care. But it is so important for me to again and again uh, repeat um, uh, when I, I will go in a few days to Goloka Dam uh, to celebrate Jamashtami or this weekend we have a nice Ratha Yatra in Berlin. I need to go there with a the car. So I will 
take care that there is enough benzene in the car, that there is enough pressure on the tires, because I want to go to Ratha Yatra. I want to go to uh, Krishna in, in, on Jamashtami. Mm. You always need in spiritual life to know what is your satya. Why are you doing all of this? What is the goal of your life? Then only the practices get life and bring you also there. So in the same way, this idea of self-care and, uh, and when you do self-care, also think of other devotees. Are they taken care of? Can they function nicely? Have, uh, is there, uh, I don't just want to take care that my um, resting place is peaceful. Let me see that they also have peaceful resting places so that they can rest and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, this, uh, therefore self-care, uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, always needs to have a social dimension. Otherwise, it needs to have a social dimension and a spiritual dimension. Otherwise, just to take care of the bodily and physical well-being uh, is, is not good enough. Underneath, mm. there needs to be roots uh, of the tree of life, uh, your spiritual uh, 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 sadhana, where you take care of, where you attend to Krishna, and offer to Krishna, and over your self-care uh, is the social dimension where you take care of others. Otherwise, it becomes selfishness. Oh, okay. That's beautiful. In fact, that was my next question. Just going to say so, so. Social dimension means what are we contributing to society? Yeah, uh, or to others also. Or to others, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, whatever be our social circle, it can be our family, it can be yeah. our community, whatever be our area of influence. So in today's world, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on self-awareness, self-expression, we could say. That this is who I am. And often people expect that, that society should change to accept me for who I am. And now this can come in various areas. It can come in terms of, uh, we don't want to go into specific. It can come in terms of various gender, gender types. And it can come in terms of various other uh, areas also. But the idea that self-expression that this is who I am and the society has to change to accept who I am. Uh, to, you earlier talked about Swabhava and uh, engaging according to our Swabhava. So where does it, uh, when, when we are acting according to our nature and contributing to society and when we, in the name of acting according to who we are, we end up disrupting society and we are entering out to pandering to ourselves. So would this difference be primarily measured by uh, social contribution? Because in today's world, people say that, you know, society should accommodate me. Society should change to accommodate me rather than that. Is, I'm not talking about devotional circle necessarily, but especially in the postmodern worldview, there is this tendency towards self-expression becoming quite disruptive towards social structures. And of course, by extension toward traditional, cultural, religious, and even spiritual structures. So to what extent can, or how can uh, self-expression be harmonized with tradition or existing structures, be they social, cultural, traditional? Yes. Yes. Uh, Self-expression is definitely a need uh, but it is only one leg uh, of the human body. There's another leg that is uh, mm, uh, to take care of others. And then there is even a third leg to take care of, of uh, your eternal uh, Dharma. I, I see, I was thinking about Dharma a lot in, in a, a life school which I'm developing uh, called the Vedic Way. And in that life school, uh, I've, we have found out that Dharma stands on 
three legs. One is, uh, it's called Svadhama, your own Dharma. It relates to how you are now, the human being. You, someone is an artist, someone is a, 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 a priest, someone is a, a field worker, someone is an uh, author, and so, so on. That's his Svadhama. That's how he is. That, that are the skills and talents um, which he is uh, born with. Then comes the second Dharma, very important. It's called Manushya Dharma. It's the ethical codexes. Don't lie to others. Don't steal. Uh, don't hurt. This Ahimsa. Don't hurt others with your, with, by following your Svadharma or your self-expression, what you can do. And then comes the last leg. Mm, uh, uh, the, mm, uh, how do you say? Uh, mm, uh, Sanatan Dharma. I have actually given the analogy of a house, the Dharma house. Everyone lives, needs to live in this Dharma house. The fundament is Svadharma. The walls, the walls relate with the uh, environment. That is Manusha Dharma. The roof, uh, which protects you from everything, is uh, Sanatan Dharma. And everything must be in, in place. Uh, let us take a very, uh, let us take a, a successful uh, businessman who at the same time harms others with his business. He may make money. He may be a moneymaker. He have, has a good intelligence for seeing opportunities for business. But if his uh, Manusha Dharma is not intact, how to take care of the environment of others, oh, he will be uh, a very uh, disturbance. Uh, and uh, let us say uh, he is ethical towards others and so on. But if he does not have a sense who they really are, they are parts of Krishna, and, uh, he, and he himself is not believing in Krishna, he's not believing in God, then his uh, help will be limited in what he, he will address only the body, but not the essential uh, nature of a person, uh, the spiritual nature as a soul. So uh, one thing alone is not enough. That is my point. You need mm -hmm. to have everything. A house is not uh, how is not a house if you only have a fundament at <laughs> the ground. Okay. You, need, you need walls and you need a roof. <laughs> mm. This is beautiful, Maharaj. So, so oh, Swadharma and Manusha Dharma. In one sense, it's such. Once again, you say it, it becomes such common sense. So, a, a person maybe a war, maybe like a warrior or a fighter. So they are doing their sadharma by fighting. But if they are reckless, they are destructive, they are exploitative, then their swadharma is not in is not contributing. So Mara, the word manushya dharma, is it used specifically in our shastra or in our tradition, or it is a more of a like a common sense understanding? Yeah, I was uh, there are different technical terms uh, being used. I'm I was I'm referring to the ethical codexes okay. where you in relationship to others uh, they are in in a, in a, in a, patanjali speaks of the yamas and niyamas yes and these normal rules for for a living um, yes i found this word manusha dharma in 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 uh, i think it was the mahabharata it's uh, just Svadharma is in relationship to yourself. The second Dharma is in relationship to others. And the third Dharma is in relationship to God, to Krishna. Oh, okay. That's beautiful. We could almost, uh, in some ways, maybe we can correlate this with the, what Krishna talks about in Bhagavad Gita. Adi Bhaut, Adi Bhuta. Adi Yagya and Adi, 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 and Adi Yagya, those three circles, the body, mind, you could say the society or environment, and then the, the Supreme. That's beautiful, Maharaj. And so what you're saying is that uh, all three need to be addressed. That's, that's when we are actually living in harmony. 
Yeah. Okay. Many things Chaitanya uh, Charan Prabhu are compositive with many things come together. Uh, mm -hmm. And one thing alone is not enough. For instance, health. Mm, uh, you need to sleep enough for health or a minimum of six hours. But if you, but you also need to eat. Second thing is there. Okay. You need to breathe also. Oh, very important for health. You need to, do you need to, what else? Water. The health is, a, and you need to exercise the body. In other words, health is a phenomena which you only mm. can experience when the, the compo when it's when it, the composites are there, the different elements which come together in such a way as to create the desired outcome of health. So in the same way, Dharma requires a few things uh, to be really there. I have so often seen. In the West, we have these very famous singers. Oh, they sing and they earn. When they sing at one place, they may earn a few million dollars and so on. And they are, they are definitely in their dharma. They are singers. They are, um, Vanashram doesn't have the highest social rank for them. They are shudras in Vanashram. But our society glorifies them. But yes. some of them, oh, what ethical life they have. They drink. They are very bad to their friends and their partners. And for money, they will sell their head even and so on. This is not a successful life. Although we realized one type of dharma to, to sing. Yes, very beautifully, very, very talented, very expressive and so on and so forth. They need all the three things to be successful in life. It's beautiful, Maharaj. Yeah, it's it's so true that uh, when I was studying my engineering, I could see that some students really had passion for engineering. They, they would just, if they get given a challenge, they could just forget everything and spend uh, hours and hours on doing those things. The kind of absorption, the kind of attraction they had was huge. But at other times, they were quite... They were into unhealthy habits. They were to smoke and drink and do other things and use abusive language at times. So in one sense, they were aligned, but aligned with one aspect of their nature. But other, other aspect, I could see their overall contribution to society uh, or even to their own well-being <laughs> was not really so much. So this is beautiful. I never thought of this in terms of dharma as, uh, as you could say, we align with ourselves, but we also align with the bigger holes that we are a part of. So the more we are aligned, then the more we can be healthily productive. Yeah. And Chaitanya Charan, these students, uh, for instance, if they are unethical, they will have a miserable life because they, they, Dharma is something which. Uh, you can't break. If you don't follow it, you won't break through it. It will break you. You know, it's the law of nature. So they have to be aligned. I have seen so many uh, successful people in one field who were just crying to me. Why am I so unhappy? Why am I so ill at ease with myself? I, I do what I like to do. And I said, let's look at the other areas. Are you... Also, uh, there it's almost like you are like a person. I said um, who said I eat salad, but I'm I have lung cancer. Why? And I said, well, maybe you smoke. <laughs> 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 oh yes, I'm smoking. <laughs> I'm smoking. Then they oh. you need to do everything uh, to have a healthy uh, life, not just eat salad and then. Smoke unhealthily, that, that will kill you. My God. Very graphic example okay. of salad on one side, but smoking on the other side. You know, maybe this could apply even in devotional circles also. Sometimes some devotees may be prolific uh, book distributors or fundraisers. But then in other aspects of their life, maybe they are a little domineering, they are a little disagreeable. And sometimes they may even 
they may be like phenomenally successful in terms of their service but then afterward they may even leave krishna bhakti so it is like what you said about the composite that lack of balance may not just happen in material life but it can also happen in devotional life with respect to one area being uh, focused at the expense of others isn't it right yes it is exactly like that and we have seen how devotees yes have due to an oversight it may not be bad intention but may just be an oversight for instance uh, an oversight in dealing properly with others respecting others that's why our radhanath maharaj always uh, stresses serve others in whatever you do serve the position which you have in this life you will you will leave it behind you will when you die uh, you will not take with you your position your be back uh, the beads at the final examination will also stay behind um, um, uh, your whole bookshelf with beautiful uh, spiritual scriptures bhagavatam chaitanya charitamrita will leave will be left behind but what you will take with you is was i serving in whatever position i was in in this life you will take with you the taste in the holy name uh, the beats may stay uh, and you will uh, also take the wisdom and the insights the realizations with you although the books stay behind so this we should never be but go for those things which are of timeless value position is not but have i served is of timeless value uh, the beads we will even in this life someone may uh, lose his beads and may take new beads uh, they uh, they are also left behind but the taste in the holy name that will be always with you uh even if you can't find your beads you will chant hare krishna hare krishna and also your uh insights and wisdom from the scriptures they will be with you even if you have not a single book with you because you have to travel some distant place and uh luggage is limited you can only take so much um still when you meet someone you will be able to explain to them verses from the gita and uh, so on so these things these invisible things if you so want mm. they are the real success in life so it is beautiful like once we we talk about material possessions not going with us but it it also applies in one sense to even in the spiritual life we have some possessions which we have to leave behind we have positions which we have to leave behind also even if they are within a spiritual society that's quite a sobering thought so going back to your tree metaphor uh, in one sense what you talk you mentioned the word invisible so that struck me so it's almost like when we go from if we consider transmit we go from uh, one body to another it's like the stem and the crown is not going to go but the root is going to go with us <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the root the root is invisible you can't yeah. see it <laughs> <laughs> okay that's beautiful so we need to take care of the visible but our priority needs to be taking care of the invisible uh, yes maharaj hi this has been such a inspiring talk uh, inspiring discussion and especially this last point quite a sobering at the same time inspiring point to contempl- uh, contemplate just like a tree is uh, mm, nourished and maintained by the roots a devotee his life is uh, nourished and maintained by his absorption in bhakti or devotional service and this absorption is something which is invisible you may not see it uh, in some one so easily you may see symptoms but not the absorption itself and what he 
feels during the time of absorption, what he realizes during this time. So the roots are the most important part of the tree of life. The spur to practice nourishes all the other aspects and whatever other aspects are there, they should serve you in your progressive journey back home, back to Godhead. So I'll try to summarize and then we can discuss. So, yeah, so today we discussed broadly on the topic of, say, the role of self-care in bhakti. That is a broad topic we discussed. And uh, you started with the metaphor of the tree, which, uh, <clears throat> which is based on the Upanishadic metaphor and Bhakti Thakur's teachings about balancing various aspects of life. So the spiritual foundation is like the root and that physical, emotional well-being is like the stem and our social contribution is like the crown. And then uh, he discussed whether does the spiritual foundation will address other, the spiritual practices themselves will address other aspects also. So you mentioned that generally for us as sadhakas, we need to work on parallel tracks that both need to be addressed. And that is what our acharyas are taught. You mentioned about the Yukta Vairagya principle, that the Goswamis. And when they exemplified very high renunciation, that was because they had the adhikar. It's not, not that they were, say, were deliberately tormenting the body or rejecting the body. Rather, they were doing whatever was required for their body for their service to Krishna. So we have to find out when, uh, what way of interacting with our body and mind can help us focus on our, our overall growth in Krishna Bhakti, on our spiritual advancement. So then, just as a, we are not the, the soul body example, the car, car body example. We are not the car, but we need the car. So we have to take due care of it. But we need to be aware of where am I going with the car? Otherwise, I may just drive for pleasure or get distracted. And then we, that the need for physical care is well recognized. But when you talk about the need for emotional care, that may not be a little bit recognized. So actually, before that, you mentioned the point that neglecting the body and the mind may be a natural result of uh, the zeal of a new convert. That where we impose our faith on others and then we impose it in terms of unsustainable practices also. Mentioned that there that actually fanaticism is often a overcompensation for our own doubts or insecurities or weaknesses. So, so when we need to take care of our emotional well-being, I think you talk about that in two terms. One is that we need to have healthy relationships. We, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That people need a sense of belonging. And so, and also we talked about acting according to our dharma. That will itself give us a certain level of satisfaction. So that is more or less related with the self-esteem needs. So the problem with the hierarchies like the Maslow, Maslow's pyramid is that they may talk about various levels of needs, but for what purpose is it ultimately? That, that is not known. So our scriptures give us that ultimate purpose that is to be fulfilled, that we develop our love for Krishna and attain Krishna by taking care of all the other needs at various levels. And then when we discussed about that, if, a devo if somebody has mental health problems and can just chanting lead to solutions of those problems? So you mentioned that in, through your retreats and through your seminars, you have found that Devotees have found solutions to even physical health problems and emotional, mental health pro emotional problems also. But we don't have to make it like this or that. We can have a balanced attitude and see what a particular person needs. So the role of adhikar is very important. That a particular devotee at a particular level may need a particular kind of self-care. And that the adhikar can be understood by taking guidance from senior devotees as well as from uh, self-observation. And you mentioned in one sense, after we do shravan, the manan and nididhyasan, those stages are like self-observation and self-application. So in that connection, actually a devotee is meant to become independently thoughtful. That the success of a spiritual teacher is that the student can, can be guided, a student knows what to do, even in the absence of the teacher. 
So devotionally, the student, the disciples are always dependent on the spiritual master, but practically they need to be able to take decisions. And that is not, that is not a defiance, but that is actually success of the, of the spiritual master's training and the disciples assimilation of those training of that training. And then we also talked about when, when somebody is being independently thoughtful, the primary focus is on how we can best serve understanding our own body and our own mind. Our mood is ultimately of service. And then especially in Kali Yuga, as things are social structures are disintegrating, greater level of self-care may be required. So, so rather than thinking of this simply as self-care, we see it as compassion. We started with the theme of compassion also that, that what people need for their spiritual journey, we take care of providing them that. So in that sense, compassion is we take care of people's spiritual needs, but also if they have certain physical or emotional needs, Varanashram is essentially not just a social structure, but it's also individual alignment. And in that case of individual alignment, we talked about three levels of dharma. It is not just swadharma. Somebody may be a singer and they may be excellent. They may love singing and they may be very good at singing, but but they may be having all kinds of uh, unhealthy habits and self-destructive behavior. So there's Swadharma, then there's Manushya Dharma, that is how they are contributing to society, and then ultimately it's Bhagavad Dharma. So many things are not isolated in life, many important things, but they are, they are composites. Just like for physical health, it's not just we have to take proper food, but food, rest, exercise, all these things have to be balanced, and ox- air, breathing. So somebody may be on salads, but they're smoking. So naturally they'll get cancer. So somebody might unidimensionally focus on one area in life. It could be in material life or even in spiritual life. And that may create some level of imbalance. So now as devotees, if we learn to, if somebody gets too attached to a particular service, that may not be because of rebelliousness, but that may be because of immaturity that they focus too much on book distribution or fundraising. So then as they grow, the balance will come. And to avoid getting imbalanced on the spiritual path also, we need to remember that there are externals in spiritual life, which we also we have to leave behind. So our record of book distributed or temples built or whatever, even our Bhagavatam said and beat back, we are not going to take. But our insights, our taste, our devotion, that is what we are going to take. And that's why the focusing on the tree, the root is most important. And then the stem and the crown can be taken care of. It is the root that is what is going to go with us sustainably, eternally, in fact. Thank you, Maharaj. Would you like to add any concluding points? I'm very satisfied with your summary. It has shown me uh, you have such a ability to structure things, to capture the essence. And I wish you and those who are listening to this podcast many, many years of uh, insightful um, studies of this beautiful Krishna consciousness, uh, which has so many wonderful jewels to offer. I'm very pleased. I enjoyed our discussion very much. And... uh, I have only my best wishes to you and all those who watch these and all the other episodes. Hare Krishna. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much, Maharaj. You have inspiring association and you are encouraging words. I see this as a blessing of Srila Prabhupada and Krishna so that I can continue my small service. Thank you, Maharaj, for your time and wisdom. Hare Krishna.